Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin was indeed in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, just because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one, man, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I forgot to mention earlier, I have to give my apologies for uh, not being able to be with you next Saturday, because I'll be on the operating table again. You wait years for an operation to come along, and they all come at once, you know, so, uh, so yeah, so you pray for me then that the operation will go okay. It's a hernia operation. The... Um, the passage that Ben just read, uh, Romans 5, verses 12 to 21, is the, the pivotal passage in Paul's letter, which connects his teaching in the earlier part of Romans um, concerning the gospel and its effects with the next uh, th uh, three chapters, chapters 6 to 8. <clears throat> and uh, between justification on the one hand and sanctification on the other. <clears throat> As we've said before, the big theme of uh, Romans is the gospel, the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes in Christ. It's the greatest message this world has ever heard because it meets the world's greatest need. It's a unique message. There's nothing else like it in the whole world. In all the world's religions or philosophies, it's unique uh, because it's uh, the gospel of grace. It's not what we have done, but what Christ has achieved on our behalf. It proclaims that everybody in the world is a sinner. Every human being who has ever lived is guilty of breaking God's laws. And so we, are under, we come under God's wrath and judgment. But the great message of the gospel is that God himself, in the person of his son, has, uh, who became one of us, he came and, as he said, he came to give his life as a ransom for many became the propitiation for our sins. He bore God's wrath uh, on that cross and satisfied the demands of God's justice that were against us. And through faith in Christ, through simply believing in him, we uh, have uh, received uh, God's free gift of uh, Christ's perfect righteousness. And uh, we are welcomed into the family of God. That's the great news, the good news that Paul has been proclaiming so far in this letter 
And we rejoice in that, don't we? We delight in it. It's the great uh, news that's come to us. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. And uh, what, what greater news can there be for uh, uh, a sinner who uh, feels crushed by a burden of their guilt and their sin, and they hear this good news that uh, they can uh, be free from their guilt and their sin from, through faith in Christ. Um, but the question is, how does this work? How can the death of one man 2,000 years ago cleanse us from our sins today? How is it possible for the death of one person to be the means of salvation for countless numbers of other people uh, in all ages uh, all around the world? How was it possible for Jesus to take our place on the cross? Uh, these are questions that are sometimes thrown against Christians as if to say, well, it's, how, that's impossible. But hopefully after this morning, you'll be able to answer those questions because in this passage, Paul provides a clear biblical explanation. First of all, verses uh, 12 uh, to 14 take us back to Genesis 3, the first man on earth, Adam. I guess we are all a bit disappointed uh, that NASA had to call off its uh, Artemis launch uh, to the moon uh, this week. I don't suppose many of you remember uh, the time when the first man landed on the moon. Uh, there was a film about it uh, watched last year called The First Man about Neil Armstrong, the first man to land on the moon. He was the uh, first human being to set foot on the moon. Well, the first man on earth was Adam. He was the first man to set foot on this earth. But it was through uh, Adam that sin came into the world. And the result of sin is death. God told Adam that he could freely eat of any uh, fruit from any of the trees in the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God warned Adam that in the day that he ate uh, that fruit that, uh, that he would die. Uh, and that's the consistent teaching of the Bible. Throughout Ezekiel 18 verse 4 says, The soul that sinned shall die. Uh, in later on Romans uh, 6 23 says the wages of sin is death and throughout the Bible uh, it's clear that God takes sin very very seriously indeed people we, we tend to have a light view of sin but we don't realize how serious sin is and how seriously God takes it God hates sin with a, a perfect hatred but you see, Adam, as the first man, wasn't just a private individual. He was, at that time, the representative head of the human race, because he was the ancestor of the entire human race. And verse 12 says that when Adam sinned, in a sense, we all sinned in him. Uh, the tense of the verb there means a single past action. And... Uh, th this teaching might sound a bit strange to us Western ears who are used to our individualism uh, that we just treat people as unconnected individuals. Um, but the Bible treats Adam as our representative head and that we were, in a sense, in him. You see, God not only deals with us as individuals, but he deals with the human race as a whole. He deals with us holistically. Um, it's like, uh, say, our prime minister, whoever that's going to be, um, makes important decisions on our behalf, uh, like leaving the European Union or declaring war and so on. Big decisions like that that... Um, are made on our behalf. We may not like the decisions, but nevertheless, it affects us. If um, we, uh, the Prime Minister decides to leave the European Union, then we're all, we've all left the European Union. Or just like maybe like a trade union leader who makes important decisions, like uh, whether to accept a pay deal or not, on behalf of the members. Or like the power of attorney, uh, recently we've uh, uh, sorted that out and uh, 
if I uh, become mentally incapacitated, uh, no rude comments, please, um, uh, that uh, Beryl is then authorised to make important decisions on my behalf. Bit of a scary thought, that. You know, that. Uh, but I suppose I'll be so incapacitated, I won't care about it then. <laughs> um, but um, you might say, well, you know, that, that sounds unfair, doesn't it? You know, uh, when uh, our Prime Minister and so on, or our trade union leader, or um, our attorney, is somebody we have a choice in selecting. And we had no choice in selecting Adam to be our representative. And that's true. It wouldn't be possible for us to have made that choice. But Adam was chosen by God to be our representative. And we couldn't possibly have made a better choice than God. Uh, you might say, but, well, if I was in Adam's place, I wouldn't have sinned like he did. But really? But how can any of us say that since we, we all... Uh, sin every day, effectively making the same bad choice that, uh, that Adam made. But most importantly, if you reject this uh, principle of Adam's position as the representative or federal head of the human race, uh, according to this teaching, uh, you must also reject Christ as the federal head of the new redeemed humanity. In other words, you'd be rejecting the way the gospel works. Verse 12 says that through one man sin entered the world. And sin here is the singular, it's not just individual sins. And in these chapters, Paul, as it were, personifies sin. It's like an evil monster that has invaded the human race. We describe sin as something that's reigning, something that makes demands. Uh, something that expects to be obeyed, something that takes opportunities to assert itself, something that deceives, something that pays wages and uh, eventually brings death. Uh, and sometimes the Bible describes sin like this. Uh, for instance, in Genesis chapter 4, remember when uh, Cain was angry with his brother Abel because his uh, sacrifice was rejected and Abel uh, was accepted. But Cain was really angry and God warned him then. He said, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Just like as if there's a, it's a wild animal waiting to pounce on him and to control him. Uh, Genesis chapter 4 verse 7. Sin, you see, is just not a matter of individual sins, but it's a, a power that seeks to dominate and control people into living a sinful, rebellious life. <clears throat> sin is totally alien to God's perfect creation. <clears throat> but Adam became the channel which Satan used to introduce uh, sin into the world. The nature of sin is that of a, a powerful, God-resisting, self-exalting force in humanity uh, that is behind all the crimes and conflicts, the atrocities and the wars and everything else that spoils and destroys God creation. It causes people to hate God and to, to hate his son, to hate his commandments, to hate his word, to hate his people. And yet sin tries to disguise itself as something good, something pleasant and attractive. It's a bit like drug addiction. <clears throat> you know, um, in the beginning it seems harmless and desirable, but it grows stronger and stronger until it finally dominates your life and destroys you. Sometimes addicts call their addiction the monkey on the back. You know, the, uh, you feed it and feed it until it dominates you, dominates your life. <clears throat> And this principle of sin and death applies to every human being since all have sinned uh, in Adam, making every human being a sinner. <clears throat> the penalty of sin is death so that every human being dies. And unless sin is dealt with through Jesus Christ, it will lead to uh, death. 
And, and when Paul speaks about death here, it doesn't just mean physical death or spiritual death. He means both because they are both connected. The one leads to the other. Sin and death, as I said, are unnatural. They are alien to God's perfect, beautiful creation. And every death is a tragedy, even if the person who dies is, uh, is very old. Uh, it, it just seems a, a tragedy uh, and unnatural, because men and women in the beginning weren't meant to die. Uh, Adam, when he sinned, didn't physically die in the day he sinned, but he died spiritually. He was expelled from the Garden of Eden. He was cut off from fellowship with God, which is life. And that's what Jesus defined life as. Uh, this is eternal life to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And when we are cut off from God, we are spiritually dead. <clears throat> His physical death came later. Just like a beautiful flower in a vase, it looks uh, lovely and beautiful for a time, but eventually it shrivels and dies because it's cut off from its source of life. And we grow old and die because sin cuts us off from God. Uh, verse 14 says, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Uh, and it uh, talks about uh, specific commandments. Uh, Adam sinned against God's specific commandment not to eat of that fruit. But those who lived then after Adam, between Adam and Moses, didn't sin against any specific commandment of God. Yet they were all still sinners. Uh, Paul said previously, they had the law written on their hearts, and so they had no excuse, and they were guilty, and they died. Um, uh, the just condemnation of, uh, for their sin. Genesis 5 uh, reads like an obituary for those who lived and died between Adam and Noah. And God's Word, really the Bible, provides the only adequate explanation for human nature. On the one hand, we are created in the image of God. Um, and people have... Uh, uh, are capable of wonderful acts of, of love and kindness and self-sacrifice. Um, you're watching uh, Saving Lives at Sea last night, and, the, and the, these people are putting their own lives at risk to, to rescue those who uh, were on the point of drowning or um, uh, dying of hypothermia and so on. And um, Amazing acts of love and kindness. And we have amazing powers of creativity, um, an ability in the arts and music and science and all kinds of ways. Um, people are amazing. And yet, on the, at the same time, human beings can be incredibly arrogant and uh, selfish and cruel. Um, so we would have another side to our nature. But thankfully, God has placed restraints on this dark side of human nature. He's given each one of us a conscience to know what is right and wrong, to restrain us. And there are uh, restraints from our family and from the society around us. And we have governments with uh, laws and law enforcement agencies that, uh, that punish evil. So it keeps evil under control so that uh, life in this world is livable and we are free to uh, uh, to live and to follow our conscience. We have, uh, thankfully, we are free to preach the gospel and so on. <clears throat> Notice here that Adam is treated as a, a real historical figure, the first human being that God created. And this flies totally in the face of contemporary beliefs that uh, the first human beings evolved from a group of hominids who came out of Africa uh, about uh, half a million years ago, whatever their latest uh, thing is. Um, if Adam, you see, was uh, not a real figure, just um, a mythological figure, as uh, some people assert, and the argument breaks down here, and the gospel is falsified. The Bible is unreliable, and so we might as well go home and forget all about it. But no, Adam was a real historical figure, just as Jesus was a real historical figure. And here in this passage, Paul uh, only talks about the effects of Adam's uh, sin on human beings. 
but his disobedience uh, affected not only his descendants, human beings, it affected the whole of creation. In Romans 8, verse 20, we read there that the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. And um, after God created the world, he declared it was, it was very good, Genesis 1, 31. And that would hardly be the case if Adam and Eve were created following many millions of years of uh, animal uh, suffering and disease and death, according to the theory of evolution. So Adam's sin not only resulted in human death and changes to plants and uh, thorns and thistles and so on, but also suffering and disease and death in animals, as well as other negative effects on creation. <clears throat> uh, Adam here is treated as the head of the human race, and when he sinned, uh, as I said, all his descendants, all of us, in a sense, sinned in him. And uh, that's called original sin. We're all born with a sinful nature, which is why we sin. <clears throat> uh, someone may object, why am I being judged for Adam's sin? Uh, but the fact is that God never judges anybody for Adam's sin, for original sin. When you, wherever you read about judgment in the Bible, it's always on the basis of actual sins that the people themselves have committed. Uh, theologians have debated how Adam's sin is transmitted to succeeding generations. Is it genetic? Suddenly passed down the male line, perhaps? Is it epigenetic? Uh, that is, uh, inherited traits that are not uh, expressed in genes but nevertheless passed down. But the Bible doesn't tell us how sin is passed down the generations. But uh, however it works, uh, the fact is that sin has clearly been passed down uh, the generations. As we see from human history, um, <clears throat> this is a record of wars and crimes and uh, man's humanity to man. And as we see in the world around us today, uh, it is passed down to the world around us. Anyone with children knows only too well you don't have to teach them how to be naughty, to be bad. Do you? They, um, uh, they, that just comes naturally. You have to teach them to be good. Uh, you don't have to teach them to be rebellious or tell lies. It, evil just comes naturally to each one of us. Uh, sin is with us from the very beginning of our existence. Um, for instance, David confessed, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Psalm 51, verse 5. Uh, David isn't saying there that his mother sinned. He's talking about his own sins. In this whole psalm, he's confessing his own sins. And... Um, so he's saying that from the moment of his conception, the moment uh, the ovum in his mother's womb was uh, uh, fertilized, became a single cell embryo from that very moment that he had a sinful nature. But what does it mean that Adam was a type, or some versions have a pattern of Christ? A type um, is, uh, comes from the, the the original Greek word, tupos, which is a kind of figurative language which refers to those Old Testament characters or institutions or events that in some way uh, prefigure uh, the kingdom of God. For example, um, get um, individuals like Melchizedek and Joshua and David who are in a way Old Testament types of Christ. You could see some of the characteristics of Christ in these Old Testament characters. Uh, the tabernacle or the temple uh, was a type of heaven. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 verses 1 to 11 says that uh, the experiences of Israel in the wilderness was a type of uh, the experience of Christians in our day. As a type is a teaching point that's given to us by God to help us to understand aspects of the Christian life, aspects of our salvation. And this passage explains how Adam 
is a type of Christ. It helps us to understand how we are saved through the death of Christ, how that works. Uh, and first of all, in verses 15 to 17, uh, Paul deals with the ways in which they are different. They are almost opposite. <clears throat> They're very different. In verse 15, there's a contrast between the offence of Adam and the free gift of grace of God through Jesus Christ. See, Adam's sin was entirely selfish. He sinned because he believed in Satan's lie that by uh, disobeying God, by eating the forbidden fruit, that uh, he would become like God. Um, but Jesus was the opposite, even though he really was God. It, the Bible says he didn't cling on to his privileges as God. Uh, Jesus' act of righteousness was entirely unselfish, unlike Adam's. He didn't die on the cross for himself, but for us, we who were his one-time enemies. Instead of exalting himself like Adam, he humbled himself by going to the cross. And uh, Jesus' act was a purely unselfish act of obedience in order, as Hebrews 2.10 says, to bring many sons to glory. Adam's sin was committed as an act of deliberate disobedience to God, whereas Jesus' death on the cross was the ultimate act of perfect obedience to the will of God. And secondly, the outcome of what they did was totally different. Adam's death brought sin and misery to mankind, uh, whereas Jesus' death uh, resulted in life and joy to those who believe in him verse 17. Adam's sin brought the human race into judgment and condemnation, but Jesus' sacrifice on the cross results in justification and righteousness to those who are his. Adam's sin resulted in the whole human race being brought under the reign of death, whereas those who are in Christ, uh, verse 17 says, will reign in life. Adam's sin brought mankind into bondage to sin and to Satan. But Christ's death brings freedom and authority for those who trust in him. See, Christ's death completely undoes the evil brought about by Adam's sin. And then thirdly, these verses emphasize that the evil consequences of Adam's sin cannot compare with the greatness of God's free gift in Christ. Adam's sin brought condemnation on all mankind, but God's grace not only takes away the condemnation, it also brings eternal life. And despite the vast multitude of sins committed by God's people down the years, God's grace covers all of them and restores us into a right relationship with himself. Instead of condemnation, we share in Christ's victory on the cross. And then in verses 18 to 21, Paul uh, sets out the ways in which Adam is similar to Christ. He prefigures Christ. Although the outcome of uh, their actions, Adam's sin and Christ's obedience, are totally opposite, uh, the principle by which they operate is exactly the same. Just as Adam's single offense brought judgment and condemnation on everyone, so Christ's act of righteous obedience brings justification to all those who, are, who trust in him. Just as when Adam sinned, his guilt is imputed to us. So when we trust in Christ, his righteousness is imputed to us. Uh, we are either in Adam or we are in Christ. And when you come to faith in Christ, we are transferred from Adam into Christ. Uh, as the Bible says, we are, uh, God transfers us from the, uh, the kingdom of darkness and brings us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. We are united to Christ. We belong to him. <clears throat> we were united to Adam because we descended for him. As the first man, the uh, our federal head, the, the representative head of the human race, uh, just as when a, a source of a river is polluted, so it pollutes the whole river. But when we are united to Christ, uh, we are united not through physical descent, uh, but through faith. And Jesus, in the same way as Adam was, he's, Jesus becomes the representative head of the new humanity. 
someone says we ought to uh, call Christians, you know, uh, uh, not homo sapiens, but homo Christophorans. We are a new species, a new race, because we are in Christ. And when we are joined to Christ, he takes our guilt and gives us the free gift of his righteousness. Being in Adam uh, brings death, but being in Christ results in life. As Paul says elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And later on in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, he contrasts Adam and Christ. He says, the first mad man, Adam, was from the earth, a man of dust. He was from the earth. The second man, Christ, is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are also those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, also are those who are of heaven. See so this contrast between the, the two branches of humanity, those who are still in Adam and those who are in Christ. <clears throat> they have different characteristics and different destinies. Uh, those who are still in Adam are heading for judgment and hell. They may say they're on the wrong side of history. They'll be consigned to the dustbin of history unless they come to Christ. Those who are in Christ are destined for glory, and the future belongs to us. And then in verse 20, Paul anticipates a possible objection. Uh, of course, in Rome, there were Christian Gentiles and Jews, and some of the Jews might have objected that this division of humanity is too simplistic. Say, so what about all those centuries of Israel's history in the Old Testament? What about the law? What about Moses? Surely you can't say all that is irrelevant. You see, Jews regarded the law of Moses as the great divider of humanity between those who kept the law and those who didn't. And, and this was a serious question in the church where there were tensions between the Jews, Jewish believers, and the Gentile believers. And Paul answers this objection by saying, yes, the introduction of the law of Moses made a big difference, but not in the way that the objector imagined. He says, the law entered that the offense might abound, verse 20. You see, the law, God didn't give the law as an answer to sin. <clears throat> in a sense, <coughs> in a typological sense, the law of Moses was given to a people who had already been redeemed. Uh, when we visited um, uh, Egypt uh, some years ago, we went on a trip to Mount Sinai and um, we had a guide uh, in, the, in the tour bus who was uh, obviously a Muslim and he gave us their version of uh, what happened at Mount Sinai. He said, uh, he said you know, God met <clears throat> with Moses at the burning bush and there at the burning bush, uh, God gave him the Ten Commandments and uh, he took those Ten Commandments and taught them to the Israelites so that they would obey him. And then he brought them out of Egypt. You know, salvation by works, isn't it? Yeah. But no, that isn't what happened, was it? You see, the uh, law was given after they'd been redeemed, after they'd been saved from slavery in Egypt. They were saved from God's judgment by the, the blood of the Passover lamb when the... Uh, angel of death passed over them on that uh, Passover night. They'd been, they'd passed through the, the Red Sea, which uh, the Bible treats as a picture of baptism. And then they were brought to Sinai. <clears throat> you see, the problem with sin is that it disguises itself. Because sin is everywhere. People today think it's normal. Think people think it's normal to sin, to lie and to cheat and to get away with what you can. Um, and one of the purposes of the law was to highlight the evil nature and seriousness of sin. And the law, coming of the law, actually increased sin, the amount of sin in the world. It doesn't mean that the law was sinful. It's the human heart was the problem. You see, the law uh, provoked sin in people. When confronted with the law, people rebelled against it. It's just like when you tell children not to do something, you know, what do you do? Oh, you see a sign, don't, uh, 
don't walk on the grass, you know, you, you want to walk on the grass, don't you? Um, so, it's just um, like Paul confessed, this was also his own experience in, in Romans chapter 7, verses 7 to 8. He says, I wouldn't have known what it was to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. He says, but sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. But that's what the law did. It highlights sin. It brings it out into the open. Um, at Sinai, soon after they received the Ten Commandments, uh, commanding them to make no other gods besides Yahweh, and not to make any graven image, what happened as soon as Moses' back was turned, the first thing they did was to make a golden calf and to worship it, directly breaking the, the first two commandments. You see, the law had no power to change the human heart. God didn't give the law to save anyone. Uh, and after receiving the law, the Israelites were as corrupt and depraved and rebellious as ever. Uh, there might have been outward conformity at times to the, the law. The Pharisees prided themselves as those who kept the commandments. You see, but when Jesus came, he exposed their hypocrisy. He exposed the subtle ways they used to avoid the demands of God's holy law. And they really didn't obey the law because they didn't love, really love God. Otherwise, they would have loved Jesus instead of hating him and plotting to kill him. Now, the effect of the law was to cause sin to abound. And yet, Paul says, the salvation of Christ was far greater than sin. He says, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Through the cross, Jesus triumphed over sin and death. First Adam brought condemnation and death to all mankind, but Jesus, the second Adam, according to 1 Corinthians 15:45, brought righteousness and eternal life to his people. Uh, as Isaac Watts him says, uh, in him the tribes of Adam boast more blessings than their fathers lost. We not just brought back into the position that Adam was in in the Garden of Eden, we are brought into a a new relationship with God as his children. And uh, uh, another hymn says uh, that uh, Jesus uh, reverses the effects as far as uh, the sin uh, is, I um, uh, can't remember the words now, but it says that um, all the effects of sin, as far as the sin affected this world, this universe, that Jesus is uh, death and his grace uh, uh, recovers the whole lot of them. <clears throat> uh, chapter 5, verse 21 <clears throat> marks the end of this, excuse me, <clears throat> this uh, <clears throat> end of this chapter marks the end of the first important section of Romans where Paul has been unpacking the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but in order to realize uh, the greatness of this good news, it has to be set against uh, the bad news. And we've seen in these chapters that God is absolutely holy and that his righteous indignation burns against all sin and iniquity. <clears throat> we have shown that sin is far more serious than we thought and that we are more sinful than we imagined. And people don't like to hear this. Many churches downplay these unpleasant but vital truths. People like liberal Christians and uh, those in the emerging church, for instance, totally deny the wrath of God and the need for Christ's atonement. You might have heard of false teachers like uh, Steve Chalk or Rob Bell, and they tend to be very tolerant to, towards, uh, in their attitude towards morality and very permissive. They support things like uh, gay Christian movement and same-sex marriage. And knowing the holiness of God and the seriousness of sin uh, preserves us from being swept along with that uh, kind of idea. And swept along with the, the, the spirit of the age and its immorality. 
On the other hand, we've seen that God's love for us is vastly greater than we could ever have imagined. And his grace is greater than all our sin. And that, that preserves us from the opposite error of uh, moralism or legalism. Um, <clears throat> Elliot was telling about this uh, chap Dan he was speaking to yesterday, chap caught up in a, in a movement that um, emphasizes uh, morality and um, emphasizes uh, a legalistic uh, kind of religion. <clears throat> it's characteristic of the cults and uh, all the false religions in the world. And it, uh, knowing the love and the grace of God preserves us from that opposite error. So may the Lord help us to always keep in mind the true nature of God, his absolute holiness and his infinite love. The gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. It brings us joy unspeakable and full of glory and the freedom and the liberty to be the sons and daughters of the living God delivers us from all bondage. And uh, the Holy Spirit works in our hearts to will and to do the, the good pleasure of God. We delight to do the will of God. It doesn't become a burden to us. <clears throat> We're free to be the sons and daughters of the living God as he intends us to be. So may we, by the grace of God, uh, have a clear understanding of the gospel. May we believe the gospel with all our hearts. May we live out the gospel. And may we, by God's grace, proclaim the gospel, because that's what the dying world needs to hear. So may God help us to do so, for Jesus' sake. Amen. <clears throat>